since 1929, you've had four individuals that have really uh, shown uh, taught systematics at, at Westminster in the main who have combined the systematics and biblical theology. You had Murray up until 1966. Uh, then you had Norman Shepard. Then you had Dick Gaffin. Then you have Lane sitting in that chair. Now, three of those men love Voss and one didn't. <laughs> Shepard was not enamored with Voss. <laughs> and the reason being one of, one is, of these one of these things is not like the other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason being is that Voss based so much upon the covenant of works and the covenant of life. And it drove Shepard crazy. And and so Shepard, and you would think that Shepard would love Voss because of the union of Christ, which had been his dissertation topic. And Murray had been so indebted to Union of Christ. But but I'm not saying Shepard definitely respected Voss, but he didn't love yeah. him, mm -hmm. and 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 it did not come through. And so, but uh, but you have Lane sitting in that chair, so I really should defer to him. No 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 but, no no, Danny, please, keep going. Please. Talk about Murray and systematic and biblical theology, because you're now doing what he's started. Well, but w one of the things that uh, Murray was so concerned to avoid is the tendency, Gaffin talks about this as well, is the tendency for systematic theology to dehistoricize biblical revelation. And what we mean by that is this, that the systematic theological method takes a locus approach, uh, looks at topics, and those topics have a in view the Bible as a finished product, the canon as it's closed, the Two Testaments are exegeted according to their topical uh, teaching, God, man, sin, um, Christ, salvation, uh, church, last thing, scripture. And, and Murray notes, and Gaffin points this out as well, Murray notes that if, if, if you're not careful, systematic theology can wind up moving in a direction that dehistoricizes and in that way, provides an abstract conception of theology and uh, of the theological uh, enterprise. So Murray says we have to remember that the original form in which revelation is given prioritizes this act of creation and condescension and God eventually um, in Murray's view, he, he will talk about a covenant of life, but that there is this historical principle, a principle of self-revelation that moves from communion in Eden and has a dynamic epochal uh, covenantal movement in view, um, a, a dynamism from the biblical text. And, and here's what that dynamism denotes. The history of special revelation, which is looking at the, the disclosure of Scripture from its historical movement, from its linear point of view, not from its topical point of view, that brings into view dynamic and mighty deeds of God that administer his kingdom and bring into view a communion bond by which the living God relates to a people he has formed for himself in a sacred bond of fellowship. Murray is so keen on that. So his point is that as you're engaging in the systematic theological enterprise, the exegesis of specific biblical texts that bring sensitivity to the history of special revelation becomes a necessary supplement in order to avoid a dogmatic and abstract uh, approach. So for instance, the quickest way I know how to put it, what is man? You must answer that question in terms of four estates, innocency, sin and misery, grace and glory, and do justice to all of them. M Murray is saying, if we don't do that, we're going to come away with an abstract topical concern rather than a, the concreteness of God's actual relating to his people in covenant. Mm. And, and so I think that's a very useful point that Murray develops. You see it in, uh, in numbers of his uh, uh, works. And then I think Gaffin really picks that up and runs with it and develops it 